I think we should probably get started. Uh, thanks so much everyone for coming along um, to teaching coding online. Uh, so this is while we're having been forced to work online, hopefully we have some free materials that will help you do that effectively. Um, so my name is Owen Brazier. I'm a computing education specialist at the Australian Computing Academy. Um, my background's in electrical engineering, but I've been working in uh, online education for the past five years or so, I'd say. And um, my colleague James, who's also my boss. Hi folks, my name is James Curran. I'm an associate professor at the University of Sydney in computer science and the academic director of the Australian Computing Academy. I've been doing this game a little bit longer than Owen, so school computing um, outreach for nearly 25 years now, and I was one of the authors of the Australian Curriculum Digital Technologies. Um, yeah. And uh, before we get going any further, um, I'd like to just mention that this is the first of a series of webinars that we'll be doing. They'll run live four to five um, on a Monday afternoon, uh, Eastern Standard Time. Um, but you'll also be able to find all of these uh, as recordings on YouTube as well. And they'll be linked to from the Australian Computing Academy website, aca.edu.au. Okay. Um, so for this session, um, we're going to have a very abridged version of coding in the digital technologies curriculum. And we'll actually be doing some practical activities to using some of the free resources that are available um, to you. Um, and then we'll show you some of the teacher features involved in that, including the teacher dashboard and the live tu uh, the tutoring interface and um, the live dashboard as well, which is a new um, thing that Grok has just released for you all. And then uh, we've also just released brand new our curriculum coverage mapping on our website. So we'll go through that and what it means and other materials that are available to you to help you uh, teach particularly um, as you teach more and more in a remote manner and any questions that you have We've allocated some time for questions and answers at the end But if you do have any questions along the way or something's not clear, uh, please just post it uh, in the chat um, So the DT curriculum is divided up into these uh, 10 key concepts um, and understanding these 10 key there's these 10 key ideas is really the key to unlocking and the understanding of the entire digital technologies curriculum. Um, today we're only be going to focus on one of those, which is the implementation um, key concept, which is the programming or coding aspect of the digital technologies curriculum. Uh, the other one highlighted here, abstraction, and that's involved in all of them, but it's particularly um, prevalent in in implementation and we'll, I will reference that um, as we go. Yeah, the, the other thing while Owen is bringing up that um, ACA curriculum link just to show you the unpacking um, is that uh, every time you're doing an example of coding, you're also doing an example of algorithms at the same time. So that icon just to the left there of implementation is algorithms. Um, but uh, you need to also make sure that you're teaching algorithms separately to doing coding too. So kids should be seeing examples of algorithms that are um, in uh, code, but they should also see examples of algorithms that are not. Okay. Yep. Thank you, James. Um, I'll clear my annotations. Um, so what does programming in the curriculum or coding, the two are used uh, interchangeably. Um, so they, they mean, I mean exactly the same thing in the school context. Um, what does that look like uh, for secondary? Um, in primary, we build up the basic ideas of programming and in secondary, we extend those ideas to be uh, a, a general to all problems. So in the curriculum language is a general purpose programming language, which simplifies down to programming in a text-based language. Any um, general purpose text-based programming language will suffice. Our recommendation is Python, so that's why we've included in there. And the ideas that are covered um, in secondary are also some of the same ideas covered in primary, which is uh, user input, which is interacting with a program after it's been written. Branching, which means uh, students write their own if statements in a secondary, in a, in a text-based language instead of just the blocks. Iteration, which is an understanding of looping and doing things multiple times. 
And the things that are actually introduced new in secondary are the concept of functions and object-oriented programming, which is only in years nine and 10. And what have you got to add to that, James? So I guess the first thing is user input branching and iteration. You basically can't write an interesting program without using some mixture of those things right up to year 11 and 12. So even though they don't formally appear um, in year nine and 10, it's implicit that students will still be doing all of those things. The, the, the key new thing that's introduced, uh, as Owen said, in year seven and eight is the idea of implementing your own functions. So that's not just calling other functions. In fact, you'd expect to do that um, from quite early on in a, in a block-based environment, but actually writing your own functions um, uh, is what's expected in year seven and eight. And in year nine and 10, that broadens out to looking modular programming more generally, and then the object-oriented paradigm specifically. And one of the reasons we like Python as a language for teaching in school is that it covers both procedural and object-oriented programming in a way that's quite accessible to kids. Yeah. Okay, so um, if you have any specific questions, I'm sure we'll be, be producing uh, more videos or webinars later on, which will have a deep dive into implementation. Um, but as an idea of the things that you actually need to teach, this is a very uh, brief summary. And some of the courses that we've uh, developed uh, cover, cover uh, most, of, most of all of these things. And so we're actually gonna have a practical look at uh, doing that um, today. So. Um, so we might uh, see if anyone can interact here. So if anyone opens the participants tab, can you let us know uh, yes or no if you've used any of the DT challenges materials before? Um, a tick for yes across the no. A tick for yes for the top across the no. Um, no, that's great. Welcome aboard. No, no. Okay, most of you haven't used. Um, so to give you all a bit of a brief introduction, um, the DT Challenges project is, we've written a series of, I guess, 20 different programming courses, maybe, maybe more now, um, uh, that cover all of the programming aspects of digital technologies from year three right through to year eight. And they're paid for by the federal government, and so they're free for all students, and so we'll be looking at um, some of those today. So. Um, if you take and a look fact, through it's, those. It's, it's worth Sorry, noting too, Owen, that at the moment um, for term two, Grok Learning has made those freely available right through to year 12 too. So if some of these activities um, that we've labeled uh, as for example, year seven and eight, but you're working with some students in years nine through to 12 that need some more introductory material in Python for term two, those things are freely available uh, also through the Grok Learning platform. And we'll be taking a, a look at um, some of those specific ones um, today. So hopefully this, uh, this webinar can be a, a little bit hands-on. Um, um, and so we'll see if that works. So if you, you all should have gotten an email uh, saying to create a, an account on Grok Learning. Uh, can anyone give us a tick for yes if you actually went ahead and did that? Um, if you do have a teacher account on, on Grok Learning? There's a, there's a, yes, you did. Great. Um, okay, so, so if, you, if you haven't had a chance to do that, now would be a great time to, to, to go and do that for yourself. So if you go to groklearning.com or you can also see the step-by-step -step guide um, that the ACA has put together, aca.edu.au slash start, will give you that teacher's starters guide for creating your account, verifying it, um, setting yourself up as a, as a verified teacher and then accessing all of the content. So feel free to go and do that now. And if you have any questions, um, feel free to, um, to whack them up in the uh, group chat and I'll answer them while Owen's talking. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Glad, you, um, glad that you followed the list of things. Um, so we're actually gonna get started. And I guess the best way for, for me to do that would just be to demo it on um, my screen and then yep to benefit everyone um, following along that they can follow. But um, if you're following along at home, um, the things you'll need to do first is log in to that account uh, you have created on um, groklearning.com. And after you log in, and the emphasis on after you're logged in, because that's when the second link will work, uh, just go to this uh, URL 
uh, cmp.ac slash webinar dash s, and the dash s is for secondary. And so I'll go ahead and do that uh, now on my screen. And by the way, if you're um, watching this webinar at a later time, that uh, workshop code will continue to work after the, the live version. So you can still follow that URL there. All right. So you see, I might have gone to a workshop or two in my time. Um, if I type in that URL here, it'll ask me to confirm what school I'm in. I happen to be in the demo school and I'll click on start workshop and now get a list of courses that um, I can and the course that we're going to look at today is this DT mini challenge intro to micro bit. Um, I've used this course already, but if you have not used this course, you should have a start button instead of this resume button. And, and the thing to note, by the way, this, uh, this workshop code that you entered in the, the URL just gives you a subset of the courses that we're going to look at today. So if you go to your normal Grok learning homepage, um, you'll actually see a much larger number of uh, freely available DT challenges. You'll see all of the primary and secondary related material and also all of Grok Learning's own courses. Um, and Owen has just uh, popped that um, URL into the, uh, into the chat session, but it's the same one here, cmp.ac slash webinar dash S for secondary. Yeah. Um, so normally when you log into Grok Learning, you won't be at the workshop page. This just gives you a subset of courses that we're going to talk about today. Yeah. Uh, so I'll give, if you, give you all a, uh, a minute. Um, can you uh, tick the no in the Zoom uh, chat if, you are, if you're not there yet? Or give us a yes if, you, if, you are, if you're ready to go. Um, thanks, Michael. Okay, great. All right. And if your uh, approach to watching the webinar today is you don't want to follow along, you just want to uh, sit there with a glass of wine and uh, relax having survived Monday afternoon, feel free to tick as well so we're not sitting here stressing about you not logging in yet. <laughs> yeah, because I, I will do a demo for everyone, but the idea is that you can, uh, you can do this yourself. So we'll... Um, We'll see if this works. This is the first one that we've done quite like this. So we're all uh, still learning ourselves as well. So Peter, Rebecca and Reem, I haven't heard from you yet. And so, yes, um, we've, uh, uh, we've got, a, got a tick from everyone so far. So I might uh, just right, I, move on, Owen. Yep. Yep. Um, so if I click resume, then it should take me to a screen uh, that looks like this, which is just the course. And this uh, interface is the Brock Learning interface that a student or anyone doing this course um, would see. You'll notice on the left hand side of the window, um, let me just get my uh, annotation tools out. Um, down here on the left hand side, you can see a series of uh, pips, so circular pips or Diamonds, the circles denote slides, the diamonds denote questions. And uh, students will soon figure out this and they'll uh, uh, skip over the notes and jump uh, straight to the questions. Um, but how we, how we navigate that is just by either clicking on it um, to go to the next slide. You'll also see a little arrow up the top, um, uh, up the top, up here. Um, where you can click on that to go to the next slide. Um, and or you can also use your left and right arrow keys to jump ahead. Um, however, what I like to do is clicking on this uh, menu icon up the top left will expand out the whole course and you can see the title of each, um, each slide deck uh, as we go. So that's uh, how to navigate through the platform. And you'll notice that uh, inside the uh, notes, you'll see some code and um, you can actually type in, in, in the code window. And when you click run, it will execute the code that you run in the platform. So for example, this course is using a device called the BBC Microbit. It's a cheap uh, uh, about $20 to $25 little um, microcontroller. Um, and so 
this is just simulating what would happen on that device if, if this code was running. So there's a virtual simulator that runs in the browser that produces the same output. And I can change that because um, we're living in sad times. I might make it uh, show a sad face. And if I click the run code button, um, you'll see on the output um, changes um, when, I, when I change the code. Yeah. And so, um, any code that I write in the platform will be executed and it's an interactive way of learning. And when you're going through with this with your students, I'd highly encourage you to uh, make changes and get them to experiment with the code. And one thing that students have a bit of, uh, I guess, a mental block on is learning that they're the, they're the ones in, in control. Um, as opposed to just trying to get it right the first time, you can get it wrong 50 times and once you get it right, it's the same, it's the same result. That it doesn't matter how many uh, times you get it wrong when you're uh, programming because uh, making mistakes is uh, common practice. Okay, so we're gonna um, jump through now, through the, through the notes and skip to the first, um, the first problem. And you'll be presented a window that looks like this. And it, the interface has changed a little bit. And this is where you can see that, the, um, that it is a problem because we have the question text uh, on the left-hand side. And then the code where we write the solution to that question um, is in on the right. Um, so here the question says, write a program that shows the happy face on the micro bit. And if we've read the notes, notes previously, we'll have a pretty good idea of how to do that. Um, and if we click the play button, it should show us an example output of what we expect to see if we get this uh, solution correct. Um, so if I type out the solution, I'll use the display object in the micro bit to show something on the display. And the thing that we're showing is an image and the image that we're choosing is this uh, so Microbit has a whole lot of pre-saved images, which is the happy one is the nicest one to get started. And so once we've written that code and we're fairly happy with it, we can click the run button, which you'll see up the top. And when we click run, that will run our code and our code here is being executed in this simulator below, which is distinct from the example solution on the left. And so here we can see a happy face and um, the code that we've written here is displayed down below. Um, we could type in an angry face, for example, and it'll show something different. And once we're happy with our solution, we can click the mark button and then we, after we click mark and click submit, um, when we click the su submit, it'll take our code and run that code through a series of test cases to see if our solution is correct or what we expect. Um, here, it says we're not quite correct yet. We're testing that the display shows a happy face, but instead it was showing an angry face. Um, so if we read the notes, it'll give us uh, intelligent hints based on my solution and describe what it expected to see. Now, if I run and submit that, um, we got that correct. Now, our submission passed our test and we're written our first microbit program. Okay, great. Anyone following along at home? Did you manage to get out the first question? Oh, nice one, Rain. Good work. Let's see who else? Any ticks from anyone else? Yep, Liam yeah. has done as well. Great work. Great. So, so a couple of things to note here. Number one is it's really important to have the two phases of run and mark and those to actually be separate things. So for before a student gets to the point of um, submitting their code from marking, you want them to be reasonably confident that the code is correct. The other thing is, is the marker is known to be quite um, pedantic. And it's deliberately the case. Some people, uh, some teachers don't like that, but um, programming is inherently um, a, an exacting science. You can't tell the computer, ah, you know, something close enough here. You've got to do exactly what it's expecting. Otherwise things are going to go downhill terribly. So 
what that means is the marker is, is also quite picky and it takes a while for students to get used to that pickiness. The upside is though, is once you are used to that level of pickiness, it means that the automated marking system can check that your code is doing exactly what the question asks of you. And I don't know a teacher anywhere that doesn't want their students to read the question carefully, work out exactly what that question is asking them to do, and then do exactly what the question asks, nothing more and nothing less. I mean, that's that standard exam strategy that we try and teach our kids all the time as well. Um, but here we have it in the, in the context of teaching programming. And I've seen a lot of live demos in the web over the years of people going, oh, look, I've ran my code and it's correct. I'm gonna move on to the next question. I look at their code and go, no, actually I can see a bug there, um, but they haven't pressed the mark button and therefore actually learned whether their code is correct or not. Um, uh, by the way, in terms of progress on the left-hand side, so you'll see that the um, diamond, once you've solved a problem goes green. If you started solving the problem and so I've submitted it to marking but haven't got it correct yet, it will go orange instead. Um, and both for students and for teachers, that can actually, that's an easy way for you to see where student progress is up to. All right, thanks James. Okay, so we're gonna jump on to the next question now, um, which is making our own uh, virtual pets. We a program that shows a picture of a rabbit on the microbits. So we'll um, take a guess that the rabbit image is just exactly the same as the code before, but the thing that we're changing is um, happy is now going to be rabbit. We'll see how that works. All right, that looks something like a rabbit. Well, if you already know it's a rabbit, it looks like a rabbit. Uh, I think that's probably the way I'd describe all of the microbit images. Um, I'll just demonstrate what James said earlier, where if we mark it an incorrect, say for example, I just copied and pasted my code from the previous problem and submitted that. We're not quite correct yet. Our submission failed the test. Um, and you'll see on the left-hand side, my uh, pip has turned orange. Orange means I've made an attempt at a solution, but not quite gotten it correct yet. And so it's an easy way to, if you're walk, wandering around the classroom and, um, and can uh, just take a quick look at the, uh, the kids' left-hand side of their screen, you can sort of see uh, if they've actually gotten their questions correct there or not. Yeah. And when you get to the teacher dashboard and um, uh, live, um, classroom features that we'll show you a little bit later on. It's that same color scheme. You can see exactly where your students are up to. Okay. So if you're so, playing along, oh, you know, yep. um, but, <clears throat> before you get that one correct, why don't you change something that's a little bit harder to spot as a bug? Let's let's replace the capital I with a lowercase I, um, and try and run that version. So. It's gonna, so when there's a syntax error or that my code is not quite correct, because our code is being executed on the device, it will uh, display an error message. And on the micro bit, you can, see, you can tell there's an error because the line has been highlighted. But the thing scrolling along the screen is actually a bit hard to read. So what you can do instead is you can click the output button, output tab next to the simulator tab um, down the bottom here. And if you click output, um, and if I try and, um, so here the error message that was scrolling along the, the simulator can be seen. Um, the line that we're looking at is name error, name image is not defined. Yeah. So it says, so we've got the correct, the incorrect name and image is something that uh, the micro bit doesn't understand is something that exists. Um, now, the rather, is, rather, than, rather than fix that, Owen, let's, um, let's use this to test another feature while we're here. So yeah. imagine either as a teacher or a student, you're actually really struggling with this. You've, you know, you've read the error message, you've stared at it for ages because capitalization is one of those things that the human mind often just can't even see the difference. So let's go and ask a tutor for, we'll save that one first, Owen, because I'm not sure whether, oh, you did run that version. So, yep, yeah. okay, cool. Um, let's go and ask a tutor for help. Uh, 
and checks on my screen. Um, okay. So, um, as I said before, we've got live tutoring uh, on a number of our courses. So if the automated marking system is not enough um, to, uh, to help you and the notes, if you look back through the notes, you can't work out what's going on, um, then uh, you can put for certain courses, uh, freely available for uh, over term two, you can access this. And, and we normally have this kind of um, help available during um, competitions as well. So the uh, Grok Learnings web comp, uh, which will be starting um, uh, shortly, and the, um, uh, and the NCSS challenge, which runs from the end of July onwards, has exactly this kind of help. Um, and the other thing is, is that you'll notice this list of things to do first. We always encourage students to actually read things. Oh, look, here's one of our tutors. Uh, Annie's just replied. It might help and you if you go to the output tab where we show you the error minus the scrolling. And so um, Annie so, has pointed out. Uh, all right, so we can have our thing. I'll write a message. Um, okay, so notice here that Owen has uh, um, uh, pasted in a snippet of code. Um, both the tutors and the students can actually paste code in either direction. Um, and in fact, that code can be runnable uh, well. So Annie will probably reply to Owen shortly. We'll give her another few seconds. Now, the other thing about these tutors is that, first of all, they've all got working with children checks um, and they're uh, trained to help students in ways that don't just give away the answers. So Annie's going to work with Owen. You'd think by now he might have learnt some of this stuff, given that he'd written the course, but he's still struggling. Um, and um, uh, so Annie will try and help him in a way that involves him actually, Owen actually doing the thinking here rather than just getting the answer. Uh, the other thing to note is that we've got an escalation process. So if a student says anything that's inappropriate and so on, it's going to come back to the um, Grok learning team and we'll contact the teacher uh, that has this associated with those student accounts and or contact the school. So we, we've got your back in terms of your kids interacting on the site and they're fully protected in terms of the relevant child protection um, legislation across the country. Uh, but if you're, if teachers are stuck and or your, uh, sorry, students are stuck or you're stuck, you can get hold of a tutor between 8 a.m. and uh, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time um, on weekdays for all yeah. of term two. And is there a schedule of which courses the tutoring's turned on for at the moment, James? Uh, there is, and that uh, selection of courses is growing all of the time. Let me see what it is right now. Um, so at the moment, it's the, we've got um, DT Challenge Chatbot for Blockly and Python, DT Challenge Turtle, um, Blockly and Python. We've got Grok's own intro to programming courses in Python and Blockly. We've got a whole bunch of the microbit courses and also the um, uh, Space Invaders JavaScript courses. Now you'll be able to tell when there's tutoring in a course because that button in the top left hand corner tutoring that Owen popped open will only appear for those courses where tutoring is enabled. Yeah, and that button in case you can't uh, spot it, if I can get my drawing tool out, is right at the top there, top left. Um, Okay. All right. Well, we might uh, leave Annie. We, we, we said to her that we would uh, use this just to demo it, but I think she probably doesn't feel that Owen actually needs um, tutoring, <laughs> so we might move. Oh, no, no. Oh, no we'll there see. we let's go. See. Let's see what Annie said. Um, uh, great. So image looks like a variable to the computer, but for the microbit, there are special images already built in. They live in capital image. Remember that capitalization is important. Nice. And that's a perfect example. That's a model model response from a tutor. Nice work, Annie. <laughs> All right. There Good. we go. Right, so let's, let's move on. So to replace that, that's a capital I there. All right. Um, so we, we can move on, um, but I think I might move on to a new function in 
um, in the micro bit, which is involving the sleep function. So if I skip to that slide, um, uh, that's all right. Thanks, Annie. <laughs> I'll jump back. And you'll notice when I clicked there, it jumps back to the problem in which Annie was um, talking to me on. Um, so looking at the sleep function, um, if we read the code, how it, how it executes, it'll run one line, then immediately jump to the next line. And then after this line is executed, then it will jump, it'll just sequentially run through all of the lines. And so to create an animation, what this code does is shows a giraffe for two seconds and then shows a duck. If I don't have a sleep there and you expect a giraffe to be seen and then a duck to be seen, if we click run, we only see a duck there because the code executes between these two lines incredibly fast, much faster than our eyes can pick up. The only thing that we see is just the duck because after the duck has been displayed, nothing else happen, happens, we never tell it to be not a duck. And so we need the sleep in there to hold the image of the giraffe for a given amount of time. And the parameters of that is sleep gets a number and the number is in milliseconds. So this is gonna sleep for 2000 milliseconds or um, two seconds. You can change that number to be um, five seconds if you really like giraffes. Um, and we'll just hang out there for a little bit before eventually um, switching to the duck. Okay, so we might um, go straight then to our next question, um, which is to write an animation using the sleep function. So, um, so how about Owen, let's, uh, since our time is rather short here today, let's um, show the teachers some other things that they have access to. So okay. see that there's a, uh, no, don't switch courses, show the solutions tab or the teacher notes. Oh, yeah. So once you're a verified teacher um, and you can either click the link on the Grok launch pad or go through your account to request verification, um, then you'll get access to the teacher's notes. And when you've completed a question correctly, you'll also get uh, access to the solutions. Um, so on the teacher's notes um, tab, it'll have an explanation of the solution and a sample solution there. So if you don't know how to solve a problem, there will be at least one or maybe multiple different ways of solving the, the same problem. And if you wanna test out that solution, this try this solutions button in the bottom will load that solution into your uh, workspace and then you can modify it as you like. Um, so you can run that code and see that the output is expected and you can also mark it um, yeah. as well. Now, before we uh, move away from Microbit entirely, um, you can also download that code onto the, the microbit itself. Now, we're not going to do that with a live microbit today, um, but if you've got a microbit or your students do, um, then you can click the download button, uh, which is right next to Mark on the right hand side there, and it will give you a hex file that you then need to drag and drop onto your plugged in uh, microbit. And it, a microbit behaves basically like a USB flash drive. You drag the file on. You'll see the little yellow um, LED on the back flashing to indicate that the new program is, is being um, downloaded and then it will start running as soon as the download process is finished. Yep. I was just grabbing the mic a bit. They, uh, they look like this. So I've just got a couple here, always usually on my desk, but this one happened to be under my desk. Um, okay, so we haven't, uh, we, are we going to jump courses now, James? Yeah, let's um, let's just do a quick sample of a few of the other courses. So the microbit is one great example of a course that involves, um, you know, some coding, but doing it in a particularly interesting context, which is using the microbit. There's a range of microbit courses, um, both full challenges and mini challenges provided by the ACA, both in Python, and then many of them also have an equivalent Blockly as well. So if you're teaching year seven and eight, for example, and you've got some kids who haven't done that much programming before, who may not be ready to go straight into Python. There's a Blockly version of many of these, which allow you to split your class up 
um, with some differentiation. Some kids could do the Blockly version to get started with and other kids can start attacking the Python version straight away. Okay, so um, there's a few ways to navigate to the different courses. I'm gonna click on the Grocklang icon in the top left to just go to the home page. Um, you can see at the top, you can see what courses have been assigned to a student. So as a teacher, you can choose what uh, course appears um, at the top here. So I'm, uh, I'm currently assigned to a university course, um, but you can choose which, which course your students um, can be assigned to. So it's really easy for them to get access to the course that you want them to do. Um, However, there's the filtering tab on the left is a really quick way to filter through all of the courses that, um, that you, you would like to see. Um, and because you've clicked a workshop, you should be enrolled into a whole into a couple of courses already. Um, so if we filter by Australian Computing Academy, they're the Australian Computing Academy courses. We're in high school, so we're gonna look at the text-based courses I think we're gonna look at one of the Python courses. This will be filter down the, um, the Python courses for year seven. And I guess, are we gonna do the chatbot, James? Yeah, let's have a quick look at chatbot and then we'll, we'll finish up with a turtle question just as another example of, of different okay. types of questions. Okay. All right. So, um, so this challenge is more of a, is a full size challenge. So the mini challenges are designed really to take, uh, depending on the amount of classroom time you've got each week, somewhere between, you know, two to three uh, weeks of classroom time, the full challenges, and especially this chatbot one is quite large. It could take five to six weeks, or it could take substantially more depending on the number of periods a week you've got for digital technologies and how long those periods are. And there's also, there's quite a lot of extension material within this challenge as well. So there's lots of different directions for strong kids to go off in. And you'll see that there are playgrounds that basically allow students to, rather than solve a particular problem that we've set, um, do their own coding thing um, in the, the courses as well. So this, this is quite an extensive course. And you can see Owen's just brought up the, uh, the chatbot playground um, at the end of the course here. I wrote a, I wrote a and you can see, by the way, in this course, um, uh, Owen has actually completed a lot more of the, this particular challenge. Um, uh, not done at all, actually. Have you? Well, congratulations, <laughs> Owen. Did you uh, print? It, did you download and print out your certificate? Uh, I got it. Yes, I did. I feel like that wall is uh, quite bare behind you. <laughs> I think you could fix that with, with certificates from the ACA. Yeah. Um, Okay, so there's a few concepts that are looked at in uh, secondary programming. This course uh, covers, um, covers most of them, but it doesn't assume any knowledge beforehand when you start writing this course. So it starts from a very simple place, um, which is hello world. Um, let's which let's do a question with user input here, Owen, because this is actually uh, quite a different beast to the way code works on the, the micro bit. Um, so to, to solve these problems, uh, these problems are all not only in a text programming language, Python, but also the code you're writing is going to produce text output and read text input from the, from the user. Yep. Now, of course, in general, you'd actually be, you know, have read through all of the notes and got to this particular point here. Owen has jumped us forward. So we're going to ask. First of all, the Python interpreter to ask the user for a piece of information. And then we're just gonna print that information out. Although Owen's chosen a slightly odd variable name, not unusual when he's first learning to program. Okay, <laughs> there we are, he's fixed it up now. Yeah, so, so uh, what these two lines of code do is provide me with a prompt, uh, a word, and then save the results of what I type variable called word and then print out whatever I typed back in. So if I type in a word and that word might be James, um, I expect that to print James back up. Yeah. So um, the thing to notice here is that the program doesn't know what is going to go into the variable word until the user actually supplies that. So if Owen puts any other text here, notice that it's actually 
has gone, <laughs> you need a pay rise. What an awkward way to ask, Owen. Um, <laughs> So um, uh, notice that Owen's plea for more cash is in black. That's because that's the user supplying that input, whereas the text that's in blue is text that's actually generated by the program. So that input prompt gets displayed first, then Owen enters his request, and then um, the enter. program is just going to print it back out again. Okay, this is not what the question is asking for. It's uh, it's trying to make one of these um, generators, like a Bodhi McBoat face generator. So if we type in the word boat, we expect the output to be Bodhi McBoat face. If we type in truck, we want trucky McTruck face. If we type in word, we want wordy McWord face. And so that's what we call this type of question. So we know it prints out whatever we type. And so if we type in boat, we get boat. The thing that we need after the boat is going to be a Y, um, which is the, the word and then um, the Y afterwards. So if I type in boat, we get boaty. Um, and then we need to add some more things after this. But new in Python and what we do to teach in this course is we use this things, uh, this concept called f strings. So Which is I short type for in format in Python. Format string. So if I type in the f, then I don't need to provide any pluses anywhere. If I have this f and then inside this special string, I can put this curly brace and insert my variable into a into this um, string. And for those of you who aren't aware, um, we use the word string and we just mean text in, 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 in the computer. So if I type now, if I type boat, I get boaty. If I do not have that F there, I'll just show you what that looks like, I get um, wordy. So we need it to, uh, we use the F word and it um, All right, and now we can use that same pattern again. Yep, word and then face. So now if I type in boat, I get Bodie McBoat face. If I type in James. That is not the way you uh, encourage your boss <laughs> to give you a pay rise, by the way, Owen, just in case you're not sure. And James the McJames face. And if I type in. Um, I want a pay rise. Train. Uh, yeah, I can type in I want to pay rise. Because remember, I mean, it's any text in here is going to be substituted in the same uh, yeah. way. I want to pay rise, Mick. I want to pay rise face. Um, that's the face that I give, by the way, when <laughs> Owen asks for a pay rise in a so way. I don't think that's, that's going to be a very effective way to do it, but um, this program does not discriminate uh, with input. So, all right. So, let's go and do a quick um, example in a different course. I would strongly encourage you as teachers to have a go at a bunch of the different courses. Um, uh, a number of the, all of the Grok courses, even ones that you would typically have to pay for, for student access are all freely available for teachers. And you can, in some jurisdictions like New South Wales that have the difference between accredited and teacher identified professional development, you can actually use the completion of those Grok courses towards your um, accredited uh, PD hours for NESA. Okay. All right. So we'll do let's do an uh, angles question. Owen, let's jump right. forward a little bit. All right. With the angles, we have a, a little handy uh, angle um, helper. So we can drag that and see that an internal angle is different from an external angle. Um, all right. And essentially this course, if you've, uh, if you've heard of turtle graphics or of logo, this is essentially turtle graphics or logo implemented within Python. So you're still using Python syntax, Python function calls, etc. But um, you're actually moving the, uh, the turtle around in exactly the same way as Seymour Papert envisaged um, in the 1980s. And it's still a very powerful mechanism. In fact, there's a large number of courses um, in different environments and, and with different skins on that are ultimately doing the same thing. So if you've done any of the hour of code courses, for example, like the frozen hour of code course, 
Um, you can have Anna and Elsa wandering around drawing um, icy lines around things, but it's still under the bonnet, still exactly the same uh, turtle graphics that's happening. So Owen's going to have a go at solving this problem. A lot of pressure here again. It's very hard to program directly in front of your boss. Let's see whether he's got it right. I know. Oh, no. it right. oh and what's happened? Uh, I um, had turned right at the end of my call. I was trying to be too clever. Um, <laughs> this is probably not the best way to solve it. But I well, we we you know, there's a lot of pressure now. Uh huh. Oh. Right, we're getting closer. Yeah. Now the other thing you can do, by the way, not that number. Yep. <laughs> Um, is uh, if, if Owen fed that to the market, make a mistake again, Owen, just get that ra last angle wrong again in some different way. Now, again, if we feed this to the automated marking system at this point, first of all, a student probably knows that this is wrong and that's one of the great advantages of the um, uh, output from Turtle Graphics. But here, notice that the auto marker actually checks all of the different lines individually and then gives you some advice and says you need to be following the, the dotted line around. Um, yeah. So the marker can do quite sophisticated things for the micro bit course that we saw first. There usually aren't that many test cases for the early problems, but actually as you get to more and more sophisticated problems, the testing can give more and more sophisticated feedback in response. All right. So there's many different ways to solve this particular problem. This way is probably not the most efficient yeah. because it does a little right turn and then a left turn just to get the angle correct. But, but notice again, we're not looking for an exact answer in code. A student can solve this problem in any way they like because we're going to run that code and check that the code behaves in the right way. Um, and that gives students great flexibility and creativity in terms of how they solve the problems. But uh, we're still going to test that the resulting output is exactly what the question expects. Okay, so we're going to look now at some of the teacher features that are available to you. Um, so all of these courses go for m multiple weeks and you can see the length of those on our, on our website. Um, but if, as a teacher, if you click the teacher dashboard, you might want to check um, how your students are going. And in my school, we can uh, scroll down and see um, all of the different um, students. And we've got some groups there. But in this group, I'm going to view all students. Actually, maybe it, what year is Let's go, and go to year eight. Year, year eight. And if we go view, the action is. view live. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna. So there's two different views, and Owen's jumped into the newest interface that we've just implemented. Um, so this was only made live in the last week or so, and we're continuing to add new features to this all of the time. The purpose of the live dashboard is essentially to show you e exactly what your students are doing at any point in time. So, uh, for example, we can see that since four o'clock, um, uh, Hermione and Luke. Uh, have been working pretty consistently. In fact, oh, Hermione's just answering a question, uh, has just run some code now. We can see exactly what, and she's just successfully solved a problem. And the, the purpose of this interface is essentially to replicate the kind of thing you'd be able to see if you're in the classroom yourself wandering around. So Luke, Luke Skywalker, Skywalker. Uh, you know, a bit of a May the 4th reference there, um, uh, has just... Uh, very recently viewed a particular slide and you basically you can see that on the other Cho Chang um, Really has had a bit of a collapse after a lesson that looks like it might have started at four o'clock um, But they seem to have given up somewhere around 420 or so um, Now that feature in combination with the fact that you can also directly uh, Or as of the next few days when we switch it on you as a teacher can use the same tutoring interface to message us on a particular problem when they're stuck. And so you'll notice, for example, um, that on the uh, pick a pet problem, uh, Luke has had one go at that and hasn't actually got it out yet. If you click on that, that can actually take you back to that same problem. And you can see that, uh, uh, unfortunately, Luke... Um, Luke's got it right. Uh, well, he's got it right now. But actually, if we clicked on that earlier, 
um, we would have seen that uh, Luke hadn't got it right. In fact, you can click down the bottom there, oh, and you can see not yet, failed a test. If we load that version, we could even see where uh, Luke had got it wrong previously. Um, and you can not, see, in fact, that, that Luke it's not didn't. not loading for me. Um, uh, yeah, it did because it's all that it changed was the, oh, yeah, the image. Fact, oh, the and image. it was the same mistake that you made before. <laughs> interestingly <laughs> enough, you and Luke Skywalker making similar mistakes. Oh, there. I, if I can be like proud. someone, I think that's not a bad. Uh... <laughs> I would be. I'd be proud to make Luke's kind of mistakes. I agree. So um, the the teacher dashboard, sorry, the live classroom gives you um, an update. And if you click on click on the um, scroll along on Luke to the right you can see see where that tick is that's now that's the point that Luke actually solved the um, the pick a pet problem so the live classroom gives you completely live updates of where they're going um, the features that we're adding next is the ability to zoom in further so you could if your class has started at just four o'clock you can see the most recent hour because obviously if an hour is only spread out over uh, you know, roughly a couple of inches of screen space, then all of those events are going to be quite close together. Um, and uh, yeah, you can get a lot out of uh, out of that and be able to directly interact with your students. Back on the um, classroom, uh, the, the main um, teacher classroom page, you can look at a particular course rather than what the students are doing live. Um, so let's see, we're going to look at that same uh, yeah. micro bit one. Um, and we can see different students have made progress here. You can also do things like um, uh, if you select some students, so say we just select Hermione, Luke uh, and Cho for now, um, you'll notice a bunch of buttons at the top have lighted up so you can create groups, you can download the marks so you can get a spreadsheet showing the progress, you can download certificates for students that have completed the course. For each student you can click on those uh, bits on the side there and it'll take you back to that same view to see where that student is up to. Each of those um, rectangles indicates uh, a module. So for example, Hermione's finished the whole first module. Um, Luke has finished the first few and has then, oh look, Luke has <laughs> just, just actually right. live finished a problem right now. Congratulations, Luke. Um, and so the, the um, manage students view allows you to drill down on a particular course that you might have set students to complete in, whereas the live classroom tells you exactly what the student is working on right now. So if you've got different students working on different courses, which as I said before, if you've got, say, the Blockly and Python version of a microbit course going for different students um, in your same class, then you can see all of those at once in the you live classroom. That group. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Now, one other thing that is worth doing just on the teacher dashboard before we disappear yep. um, is to point out, well, how do you actually enroll students um, in, in the system? So um, uh, you can, for example, if you've already got students in the system, oops, I was jumping around. All right, let's register yes. first. So um, you can either uh, manually put in the students details or you can import students and there's a couple of ways you can do that at the moment you can um, download a spreadsheet from us and then load into the data into that spreadsheet and typically you might use that as an export from your learning management system or your, your student management system so your class list you can put that into a spreadsheet and upload it also if your school uses Google Classroom then you can uh, now directly import from your Google Classroom. We'll soon be adding support for Microsoft Teams and um, Canvas as well. So if you use any of those different systems, then you can import data that way. And then for the free DT challenges and other free content from the ACA, that includes our cybersecurity project, all you need to do is register the students. You don't actually need to um, then pay for subscriptions. If you want access to other Grok content like Web Comp or the NCSS Challenge, at that point you would then go to the, the second part, which would be to um, uh, pay for uh, subscriptions. So once you've got your students in the system, let's go and um, uh, go back to Teacher Dashboard again. Yeah. And let's look at our Year 8 class. Say we want to now take all of our year eight students, so we can click there 
um, we can now assign a particular challenge uh, to those students. So let's say we want them to now do the um, cryptography challenge, which is a year seven and eight activity developed by the ACA that teaches cybersecurity in the context of year seven and eight digital technologies. All of these students have now been assigned that particular course and it will appear in that top slot when they log on to the to Grok Learning in the launch pad. So the so, course that they would see right now is where Owen currently has the programming and digital systems course in the top left. Right there, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, um, uh, yep. Owen, let's quickly jump over to the curriculum coverage and supporting materials. Yep. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll switch to Q and A. Okay. Um, so curriculum coverage, um, we can look at that on our website. And so uh, I guess the course that we want, one of the ones we looked at was the Python chatbot. Um, I just typed in chat and this one came up. You can also use the filters on the left. Um, we do curriculum coverage a little bit differently um, at the ACA, and we just uh, launched this last week on our website. Instead of just linking to the uh, to the Australian curriculum codes, um, because there's many concepts that are covered inside an Australian curriculum code, we actually drill down a little bit more and tell you exactly what elements in that code are covered and which ones are not covered. Yeah, because so, you'll find a, a lot of activities out there will say they're covering a particular um, content description in the Australian curriculum, but actually those content descriptions are, are quite large and often an activity will only cover some part of it. So you really need to be quite careful about that. And so we've, we've broken up in our unpacking the curriculum website, more of the details or how to interpret each of those, those fragments. And that's what we um, do our concept mapping to for the challenges. Yeah, so you can see that this course covers implementing digital solutions, covers branching iteration and general purpose programming, but it doesn't quite touch on functions. Um, user input and solution. And if you click on, let's just click on one of those quickly now. Um, iteration. Where that yep. will take you through to is the part of the unpacking site that describes exactly what the expectations um, that we have for a student to, to do that thing. So it's got a definition um, and then it's it's got a, uh, a snippet of code. Yeah, and so Sorry, a snippet of description for description. So code. you can, if you mouse over, you can see exactly which lines of the um, of the curriculum refer to that um, uh, element in the curriculum. So, for example, students can write code without any scaffold or starting code, and they're the uh, words that are highlighted that are relevant to that outcome. And so if you're a year seven and eight teacher and you want all of the outcomes on a page, you can click this unpack button and you'll get the entire Australian curriculum um, outcomes on a page with the band description, the achievement standard, and then each of the key concepts has all of the outcomes that are covered in the year seven, eight curriculum for digital technologies and definitions of all of those just in one uh, easy view. And so we link against these um, elements of each um, curriculum, uh, each content description. So right. let's, um, let's just quickly jump back to the resources section and mention a couple of other things that we haven't had time to, um, to, to fit in a one hour. So the first thing we've got, a, as I mentioned before, we've got a set of challenges on cybersecurity. So there are four of those challenges at the moment designed for year seven to 12 students. The first one, uh, information privacy and security is something that we recommend every Australian child between year seven and 12 go and do. Um, um, next, next, just next it Monday, James, no, Monday webinar next week is going to be on the cybersecurity. That's right. So um, Bruce Fuder and I will be uh, presenting next week's webinar and we'll be looking at that cybersecurity challenge. And then we've got three more challenges that cover different aspects of cybersecurity in conjunction with the digital technologies curriculum for year seven, eight and nine and ten. Um, okay. We've also got the DT at home activities, which are a set of PDF uh, printable activities for kids to be able to do at home with their parents. They're really designed to be 
accessible to parents that don't have a background um, and to work for kids who either don't have uh, great or any internet access at home or a device that they can do the activity on. Yep. And so how you can navigate which ones might be relevant for you, we click on DT at home, then we can uh, filter by a year level and you can see ones that have been tagged at to meet the seven and eight year level uh, outcomes. So looking at logic gates or um, graphs or uh, the cellular automoji one is quite fun. Um, so there's uh, unplugged activities designed um, to cover Australian curriculum outcomes as well. Yeah, the other thing that's very quickly worth noticing, the other ACA activities, if you click on that one instead. Yeah. Um, there's a bunch of other resources and things you can use. So for example, we've got a set of cards for cybersecurity, a set of cards for uh, a decision tree activity. So you can basically find printables and things like that here. And there's a bunch of posters and other resources you can find um, in various places around our website the under the four teachers section. section. Okay. All right. I think that is all the material uh, we had to cover. Um, oh, I think that said, we're um, uh, we're worth more money. Please don't encourage <laughs> Owen to ask for more pay rises than necessary. Um, um, uh, so, and, and Michael's uh, actually just raised a question or said uh, um, that they has uh, a kid in year five and they'd love to go through the cybersecurity course. Uh, we've actually had a lot of feedback from primary school teachers that they think that the intro cybersecurity is suitable for their kids. Um, we agree, in fact, to the point where we've convinced our partners in that project, which is the big four banks and British Telecom, um, that we're going to develop a year five, six version of Cyber One. That'll be uh, one of the next tasks that we're actually attacking in the ACA. Um, so uh, look out for that. In the next few months, we'll be making an announcement when that's available.